For 16 years, they didn't do anything. Which brings us to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah and Haggai and Ezra, all of these individuals are contemporaries. All of them were living during the same time. All of them was writing during the same time. And so the Bible lets us know over in Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah is the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. And we know what the cupbearer is. Before uh, anything was placed before the king, the cupbearer had to drink or eat before they were going to give that particular meal to the king. And so on one particular day, King Artaxerxes noticed that uh, there was something different about Nehemiah. The Bible even says his countenance had failed. And so King Artaxerxes is asking Nehemiah, what's going on? Why have your countenance failed? And Nehemiah told the king, God has allowed my people to come out of captivity. God has allowed us to go back home to our home city in Jerusalem. And they're not doing anything. And so King Artaxerxes write this letter, sending Nehemiah out. So if anyone stopped Nehemiah, if anyone uh, questioned him, he had this letter from the king that said he had permission to be out here. And so Nehemiah gets home, and Nehemiah more or less just starts preaching to those people about the importance of building, about the importance of giving God back what he has so uh, awesomely has given us in every day of our lives. So in Nehemiah chapter 2 to Nehemiah chapter 7, they're going to rebuild these walls. You have the farmers of that day. You have the doctors, the lawyers, the scientists, all the philosophers at that day. They're out there and they're building the wall. Everyone working together Everyone working in harmony to do what God has told us to do. So in Nehemiah chapter 8, in verse number 1, I have three quick points for you in this particular chapter. In Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible here lets us know how these, how these individuals, how they had a hearing for the word of Almighty God. And the Bible lets us know also in that particular chapter how they were hungering for the word of Almighty God. And then the Bible lets us know in verse number 8, if we have time this morning, these people also had an honoring for the word of Almighty God. So again, the question for consideration this morning is, are you bored by God or are you blown away by God? In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, verse number 2 especially, the Bible lets us know how they come to Ezra. Ezra being the scribe, Ezra being the priest. And they tell Ezra, preach unto us the word of God. Wouldn't that be great today? If people just came to us and said, well, you know what? Tell me what I have to do to be saved. Tell me what the Bible says about salvation. How about you just preach the word of God unto me today? And so the Bible says, Ezra the scribe, he stood on top of the pulpit. And in verse 2 says, from morning until midday, yes. he taught the word of Almighty God. Where did Ezra get that from? Where did Ezra get that idea of the importance of reading and teaching the word of Almighty God? First of all, Ezra got that from the law of Moses. Well, how do you know that? Because again, during this time in history, they didn't have the full revelation like we do today, like we have today. But they did have those first five books of the Bible that we know to be the law of Moses. And so they use this law of Moses to govern their lives, to rule their lives, because they're still living under the law of Moses. Now, the reason why this is of interest this morning is because when these people went into captivity, they didn't want anything to do with the word of God. They didn't want to hear from God until they got into captivity. And when the going got tough, they began to cry out to God. They began to cry out to David. They began to cry out to Ezekiel. They began to cry out to Isaiah, all of these prophets. And what does God do? God says, I'll let you go back home. The Bible says from morning until midday. Again, where did Ezra get that idea from? If you remember in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 1, Deuteronomy chapter 4, Deuteronomy chapter 7, and Deuteronomy chapter 8. In those particular chapters, some two times in each chapter, Moses talks about the importance of the Word of God. When you rise, you ought to read the Word of God. When you're going through the day, 
you ought to read the word of God. And then he says, at night, you have to read the word of God as well. But I've come to realize, many of us, this is what we like to do. We like to go work a long, hard day. Nothing wrong with that. You have to work, you have to live, you have to eat. But we wait till about 10 o'clock at night. We get up in the bed and we get real comfortable and we say, you know what? This is going to be our time to study the Bible. But I've come to realize anytime I get in the bed at that time, you know what? It's time to go to bed. I'm not going to do too much reading that night. You have to make time for the word of God. You have to make time for what's important. And the word of God is the most important thing you have in your life. Again, the Bible says from morning until midday, Moses says when they rise. That talking about children teaching the word of God. When they go throughout the day, morning, noon, and night, you have to teach them the word of God. Now, I'm not saying we can't have time for other things. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that at all. Again, God put us on earth to enjoy all the things life has to offer. God put us on earth to enjoy all the things we want to do, but there also has to be time for the word of God. There also has to be time for putting God above whatever it is we want to do. Again, the Bible talks about in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10. For Ezra prepared his heart to see the law of the Lord and to do it in teaching Israel statutes and judgments. If you remember in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 1 and 2, the Bible there lets us know that when Josiah became king at eight years old, what did he do that all the kings before him failed to do? Josiah says, let's go get the word of God. He said, let's go read the word of God because for so many years we have rejected the word of God. We have neglected the word of God. Now he says, let's go get the word of God and let's preach it. Here he is at eight years old. Now again, uh, he does. Uh, many historians tell us, Josephus, uh, many other historians let us know how uh, he wasn't ruling by himself. He put himself around individuals who knew more than he did that could help him lead at eight years old. And that's why Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example to the believers in word and conversation and charity and faith and spirit and in purity. No matter what age you are, you can make a difference with God. You can make a difference with the word of God. Again, Ezra says, from morning until midday, these people had a hungering for the word of God. These people couldn't get enough of the word of God. I believe many say today, and I've heard, I'm sure you've heard as well, many say today, well, you know what? There's going to come a time where one day the government is going to say we have to start reading our Bibles. They're going to say, you know what? You, you can't read your Bible in a public place anymore. But I've also come to realize many of those same people, they want to read it anyway. Because those of us who read the word of God, who study the word of God, who know the word of God, we know for a fact no one can take the word of God from us. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 4, we also have to be willing to acknowledge the word of God as well. In Matthew 4 verse 4, the Bible says, Christ there says to Satan, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, there is also an enemy or enemies that stop us from reading the word of God. That allow us to be bored by the word of God. What are those enemies? First of all, in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, we read about that one enemy. The Bible talks about how Satan walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. John 8 verse 44, ye are of your father the devil. The Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Satan has transformed himself into an angel of light. Here you have the devil trying to tempt Jesus. If you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And the context actually reveals for us, if Jesus would have done that, nothing would have been wrong because the fast for 40 days and 40 nights, it was already over with. But Jesus never does a miracle for or about himself. And what I mean by that is Jesus never does a miracle for his own benefit. When you read about the miracles throughout the book of John, throughout the entire New Testament, every miracle our Lord did ultimately led people to being converted. 
It wasn't about how great he was at healing people, about fixing problems. He was ultimately trying to lead those people to him. What causes us to be bored by God? Again, Satan. But second of all, procrastination. If we're all honest with ourselves, and I'm the first to raise my hand, we procrastinate in doing a lot of things. We put the Bible study on the back where we say, you know what, when I have more time, I'll study the word of God. But what if God treated us that way? What if God said, when you finally study your Bible, I'll start giving you blessings? Man, all of us would be reading our Bibles. What if God said, the more you read, the more you study, the more you grow in your walk with Christ, I'll give you more. But God doesn't have to promise to give us anything. He's already given us, according to John, verse 3, 10, John 3, verse 16, the very best he has to offer. He's already given us his son. Nehemiah tells these people, well, the people go to Ezra and say, preach unto us the word of Almighty God. Again, in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 and verse 2, these people had a hungering for the word of God. But notice what else the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 8. As you continue to read from Nehemiah chapter 8 and following, the Bible there also lets us know how these people had a hearing for the word of God. Many people don't mind hungering after the word of God. Many people don't mind seeing what the Bible has to say. But are you willing to hear? Are you willing to listen? Paul says in Romans 10, 17, faith coming by hearing. Hearing continuing. Faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's not enough just to hear the gospel one time, be baptized, and be that, that, that's great. But it's not enough just to do that. Why is that? Because sin is real in the world. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But if I don't have the word of God in my heart, if my conscience has not been trained by the word of God, I'm going to do what I want to do every single time and no one's going to tell me anything different. That's why we have to train our minds with and by the word of God. Well, why do we do that? Why should we do that? When we train our minds and develop our minds after the word of God, we are becoming more like our Lord. I don't know about you, but I find myself being closer to my Lord doing two things. That's praying to him and that's studying my Bible. Because God does something for me when I do those two things. I take my care to God, and it's almost as if sometimes we're waiting for God to give us a sign. But when we open our eyes and we see our Bible staring at us, there's your sign. Because when I read the Bible and I read about all these individuals who struggle the same way I do, the same way you do, how did they overcome those struggles? They went to the Word of God. The Bible talks about later on in their history. Unfortunately, this same generation, they failed to appreciate the word of God and what happened. The Bible lets us know in Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. There is a famine in the land, not of bread nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the word of God. And we have, between our Old Testament and our New Testament, that, that, that little blank page there. Well, that's 600 years of history. That's that intertestamental period where for 600 years, they didn't hear a word from God. They didn't hear a message. For 600 years, God did not give them any sign or any message. And then you have John the Baptist coming saying, make you straightway and prepare. Jesus is on his way. Jesus is coming. Again, they not only had a hungering for the word of God, they not only had a hearing for the word of God, but notice what the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 7 and verse number 8. Verse number 8 says, so they read distinctly, New King James Version, so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense, King James Version says, and they caused them or they helped them to understand the reading. That lets me know that I can understand the Bible. 
It, 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 it just drives me insane. And everyone knows it when people say we can't understand the Bible. You know what I find in those two things? I find an individual who is procrastinated, and I also find laziness. Because once you read the word of God for yourself, you know what you come to realize? Man, I can understand this thing. It's really not as difficult as I thought it was. Now, there are indeed some sections of scripture that are more difficult to understand than others, that being the book of Romans, that being Galatians, uh, that being some passages in the book of Revelation. Some books are more difficult to understand than others before the general being saved from your sins. And all of, us, all, of, all of us can understand the book. The Bible says he gave the sense and he caused them to understand the reading. What was being read to them, what was being given to them, they can understand. I have the privilege very often of going back to Memphis and Foundations and talking to the young men about uh, the importance of preaching. And one of the things I always stress to them is context. I love context. And the reason for that is simple. You can lead someone astray by not knowing the desired intent from the author. And if you don't know the context of the verse, you shouldn't teach the verse. It's no shame in not knowing. The only shame is trying to act like you know. Because once you don't know, what does that cause you to do? It causes you to go investigate. And once you investigate and you come to realize this is some good stuff. This can save someone from their sins. Are you bored by God? But secondly, are you blown away by God? When I read the Bible, it just blows me away. For the simple fact that when you trace the genealogy of Jesus, from Genesis 3 verse 15, all the way to Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25, when you read about the scheme of redemption, Jesus coming to save us from our sins, Jesus coming to be our advocate. Jesus coming to be our mediator. First John 2, 1 and 2. Jesus coming to be our lawyer. Man, that should just blow us away. The fact that there are only 22 verses written about the virgin birth. Matthew chapter 1, 18 down to verse 25 and Luke chapter 1 and following. To, 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 to know that I can trace all of those things back to the Old Testament. Man, that just blows me away. The fact that I can go to my Old Testament to passages such as Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, the virgin birth, Isaiah 7 and verse number 14, the government shall sit upon his shoulders, wonderful counselor, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Man, that just blows me away. Those in Nehemiah chapter 8, they were blown away by God. But unfortunately, them being blown away by God was only after the fact that they put themselves into some trouble. When we go to funerals, when we talk to loved ones, why do we share with them the Bible? Why do we read scripture to them? Because we know scripture can blow them away in a good sense. Scripture gives us or it does something for us that the, that the philosophies of man cannot do for us. This nation, they were bored by God, no doubt about it. They were bored by the fact of, first of all, God allowed them or God in their mind sent them into captivity when they themselves put themselves in that situation. But once they got down to the bottom, once they hit rock bottom, were they finally able to look up and see God just a little clearer? It's almost as if sometimes we think, oh, we have arrived. We think we're on the same level as God is. And so in our minds, we're looking eye to eye with God. And so God just has to humble us. And God has to let us know there's only one person in charge. There's only one person who's running all of this. And God said, that's me. How can we overcome being bored by God? How can we overcome that word carries the idea of being burdensome, being weary? How can we overcome being bored by God? How can we overcome being bored by the word of God? We have to get into the word of God. 
once we get into the word of God and the word of God gets into us, we are better for it. Not only will we see our lives change, not only will we see the lives of those around us change, but we can really make some impact to help some folks go to heaven. Because that's what it's all about. Helping people overcome being bored so they can now be blown away by God. What does the word of God do for you? Does it encourage you? Does it motivate you? Does it give you hope? The word of God should do all those things, but it should never bore us. I think of the word of God is boring to us and we have really not even cracked the cover of the book. If you're not a child of God this morning, why not be one? Again, the greatest and the best thing you can do with your life is give your life to Jesus. Again, Paul said in Romans 10 and 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, being willing to believe, according to Hebrews 11 and verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Being willing to repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5, confess him as Lord, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and being baptized, Romans 6, 3 and 4, being washed, 1 Peter 3 verse 21, being renewed, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Galatians 3, 26, 27. For many of you that have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I want to put on Christ. And for those who have fallen short, for those who have become bored by the word of God, again, let the word of God convict you to change. The Bible says in 1 John 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We encourage you this morning, whatever your needs are, please come while we stand and sing. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power 